morning, everyone. Well, I'm Scott Stoner, Director of Programs and Resources for APAP. Uh, welcome everybody virtually who's joining us this morning through HowlRound TV. We hope you've been enjoying the, the conference virtually thus far. Uh, welcome also to our second annual Five Minutes to Shine presentation. As uh, those of you who were here last year know, last year's um, theme, the conference theme was Shine. So we decided, well, why not do Five Minutes to Shine and extend our Bashaka Shaka approach that we do in a Saturday plenary and bring it uh, you know, home to artists and members uh, and just see you know, who we can, uh, who we can attract to, uh, to bring in a, a, a best idea. Uh, and it was successful, we felt, last year. So that's, we're doing it again. And it also coincides with this year's theme, which is, of course, together. So it's bringing us together for that. So I'm not going to say much more, because we, we have a moderator this morning, um, the lovely and talented Alicia Anstead, actually, who has worked very, uh, has spent a lot of time working with the, the folks you're going to see on their, with their presentations. It's not easy to do this. It's not easy to do something in five minutes, uh, you know, no matter what your idea or your message is. But she has uh, done yeoman's work in helping to, to craft these presentations with our finalists. And as you all know, the audience is going to vote at the end of these presentations uh, on the presentation that they think should go next door to the awards luncheon um, at noon and be presented to everybody at the awards luncheon. So uh, Alicia Anstead is uh, a, a journalist, a writer. Um, she's a co-producer. She's, for us here at APAP, she's, she is one of our co-producers and technical director for the keynote plenary sessions and uh, editor, of course, of the Inside Arts magazine. So, Alicia Anstead. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. And welcome, everyone. Um, it's so great to see so many of you here. Those of you who have your smartphones or at, and, uh, and, are, and are on Twitter and Facebook, it would be awesome if you sent something out and invited more people to join us, even those of you who are watching on television. This, this event relies on critical mass to make decisions about who advances to the next level. Um, so we'd be delighted if you shared that information with others who are with us in the room and beyond. Um, this is a wonderful process. I'm not going to take too much time telling you about it, but each person today is going to speak for five minutes only and tell you a story about something brilliant in their career, something that is a, a, a shinable moment that we hope you can take home with you as an act of inspiration um, or something that helps you more of a brilliant way as well. Um, and we're going to just kick right off. Let me make sure I've told you everything that I need to tell you. The really key part for you as an audience member is to vote. And you should have uh, a voting uh, in the room. And uh, we'll tally them at the end. And whoever advances to the next level will be giving this presentation in front of the entire membership, board of directors, and others in the room when we go to the awards. And that's, that's a really special event as well. Um, we hope those of you who are in the room can join us for that. I believe there are still tickets available. Is that right, Scott, for the awards luncheon? There are. Um, so it's going to be very quickly. So we're just going to kick off. I'm not going to do long bios for any names will be up on the screen. You can Google them on your time and find out more about who they are. Um, and I think you'll learn an awful lot about them in just five minutes. So we'd like to begin with Ariel Fausto, a partner and design leader at H3 Collaborative Architect. Thank you. I love going first. OK. Um, I think we're ready to go. Oh, no, that's the, not the first slide. There you go. So my name is Ariel Fausto, and I like to think I have one of the better jobs in the world. As an architect, I get to work with folks like you, designing places for theater, music, dance, and art. We focus on the intersection of arts, culture, and public space, which gives us a chance to observe the world of performance from a different vantage point. For instance, dinner before the show. When I say that, I'm sure everyone here understands what I'm talking about. I'm sure everyone here has a memory connected to this phrase. 
It brings to mind a uniquely Broadway New York, yet ubiquitous experience anywhere in the country. Have a nice dinner somewhere near the theater, skip the coffee and dessert, rush off to the theater before the first act. Dinner before the show. It's really um, quite a wonderful and um, idea, and it perfectly describes this unique relationship between um, food, performance, and public space. I don't know that my slides are progressing, but, ah, there you go. Um, it, it's actually a very powerful idea. We know the experience of performance happens well before the curtain goes up. And when we all think about our audience, we should not only be thinking about their appetite for Shakespeare, but also their appetite for wine, cheese, scotch, soda, or even juice boxes. One of my most vivid memories of food and performance happened while I was traveling through Spain almost 20 years ago. I was a lot younger. I know I look young, but I was a lot younger. Um, I was in Madrid trying to get to Portugal. I was tired, mostly broke, and discouraged when I realized just how difficult it was to get to Lisbon from Madrid, especially when you're broke. Luck would have it that Vim Vender's new film, Lisbon Story, was playing at this little movie theater uh, near the hostel I was staying at. This was my consolation prize. Now, any American who has seen a movie in Europe will understand one fundamental difference about movies here versus there. Alcohol. It wasn't just the beer I was watching, uh, I was having while uh, in the lobby bar with a few locals, it was the beer I was enjoying while watching the movie. It confirmed one thing for me, beer is better than soda. <laughs> and for the first time, I realized that many of the cultural differences I was experiencing um, first began with their relationship to food. I never, made it I never made it to Portugal, but I got in a great film and a lasting memory. Today, audiences are changing, and the experience of performance for those audiences is changing. Performance has become more accessible and is now reaching out to a broader demographic. Young, old, rich, poor, mainstream, avant-garde. Performance has opened up for everyone, and so each of these different audiences expects a different experience. There's the dinner before the show model of Broadway, but if you're going downtown to the Flea Theater, it's a drink, a show, and a drink, right? Uh, if you're going to the Summer Film Festival at Bryant Park, it's also different. It's a picnic and a show, right? Which is often preceded by a stampede of blanket throwers trying to get their space um, on the lawn. So I want everyone to think about this happens all the time, all right, and is dangerous. Um, think about your audience and think about your lobby and public spaces. The nature of the theater lobby has come a long way since those 19th century theaters. Today, your lobby is everything to everyone. It's your first impression, your intermission space, your fundraising gala dinner space, your pre-performance or post-performance lecture space, your digital interactive space. Most importantly, it's the first opportunity you have to reveal the mission of your theater to your audience. What do you want to tell them? At LCT3, on top of the Vivian Beaumont Theater at Lincoln Center, this is on the roof. There is no stage door, right? So audiences and artists inevitably find their way to the same lobby, the same bar, and the same outdoor terrace overlooking Lincoln Center. This is not a bad way to start and end a performance. As architects, we see and are part of the creation and revitalization of many theaters, performance venues, and performance venues across the country. And I think we're entering a new era of performance, food, and public space. Food culture is big, and whether before, during, or after the show, food and drink will always play a huge part in that experience. Our cultural venues are now the progenitors of a new type of public space, one that has the opportunity to co connect people to culture in new ways. Theaters, performing arts centers, libraries, museums, must continue to evolve and create places for conversation and a sense of community. Our collective experience of theater, dance, or music 
may culminate with a performance, but it often begins with a house salad and may even end with a cocktail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you. Um, next up is um, Knitting Songs with opera singer uh, Melanie Gall. And Melanie, I think you can use, yeah, you want, if you want to move the stand away, that would be great. Thanks. All right, I'm ready. My sister is a crazy knitter. Now, this isn't, the, this isn't the first time her hobby has taken over her life. There was bird watching, there was scrapbooking, and then one day the sticker machine and the double-sided glitter tape disappeared. I started tripping over pointy sticks, balls of wool, and yes, knitting. Now, if you know a knitter, or if you're a knitter yourself, you'll know it isn't simply a matter of stitching up the occasional scarf. We're roommates in New York, and in our apartment we have a yarn swift, a ball winder, six bags of full sheep fleeces, and over 300 balls of yarn. I'm a freelancer, and I don't have a lot of time for extra hobbies. And at first I was resentful about how my sister's hobby took over my entire life until I found the first knitting song. It was an accidental find. I was programming music into a, a music library database looking for songs, and I found this song called, And Then She'd Knit, Knit, Knit. Went like this. He'd take a hug, then he'd hug her some more, and she'd knit, 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 knit. It was adorable. And just like in New York, in your apartment, when you see one mouse and you know there are probably a dozen more, I thought maybe, maybe there were more knitting songs out there, just waiting for me to find them. Five years later, I have found over 100 knitting songs. 100 knitting songs from libraries, from antique stores, from private collections. So what does a girl do with a binder full of knitting music? Well, at first I thought I'd perform them in a concert setting, like a classical recital. But my sister paused in counting stitches long enough to look up and suggest, this music was written to engage the knitters, so let them knit. I wrote a cabaret featuring these knitting songs, a cabaret where knitters were encouraged to knit. They get a ticket discount if they bring their knitting. We leave the house lights on halfway, so they can see what they're doing, and I bring extra knitting. I bring scarves that I hand out. People stitch away at them, and they're later donated to charity. The results have been interesting. I mean, the knitters love it. They, they knit a sock. They watch a show. <laughs> the scarves I've passed out have been, have been stitched on from dozens of different hands, from hundreds of different people all over the world. Instead of strangers in a theater, there's a sense of community being built together. However, however, even though, even though it usually goes well, I mean, sometimes non-knitters take the wool. Once there was this hipster type guy who didn't know how to knit, he took the ball, he took the yarn, and he just sort of held it in his hand and turned it around. But there have been issues, like counting stitches. So one time I was singing, knit one, purl two, this sweater, my darling's for you. And you could clear, clearly hear in the audience someone going, 51, 62, 184. And then there was the incident of the mitten. In my show, I, I knit a mitten and I sing a song about the mitten. So there I was about to sing, working on my mitten, when all of a sudden in the front row, a woman stood up. She said, honey, you dropped a stitch. Let me fix that. I'm not kidding. She came on stage, took my mitt, it was like, the stage was like this, came up, took my mitten back to her seat, and I stood there, and it was so awkward. But, but eventually, eventually, I, I had to sing, the pretty little mitt that kitty knit, with, with no mitten. Uh, metal knitting needles are incredibly loud when they're dropped in a theater, especially when they roll all the way down the aisle, and they're followed by a knitter trying to get them. And often knitters think, they think that since they're knitting at a show, and the show is about knitting, well, that they are a vocal and very, very involved, very involved part of the show. 
Now, about a month ago, I went up to visit my grandmother in Toronto. My grandmother, she's 93, you'll see her in a second, she's 93 and she too is a crazy knitter. And I stood there watching my grandmother, my mother, and my sister knit, and I started to think. Because her husband, my grandfather, was a big band singer in the 1940s, and, and growing up, I was always the girl who had inherited the voice of the family. But watching all the stitching going on, I, I thought that actually there was another tradition being inherited, a, a knitting tradition, who knew? A one that brought my sister and me together. Now recently, my sister made another purchase, a sewing machine and four huge bags full of fabric. And, well, I'm on it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Melanie. Next up, um, <coughs> excuse me, is Carolyn Surick, a musician and poet with, um, and she's a musician, a musician with Ensemble Galilee. Yeah. Good morning, my name is Carolyn Surick and I play the viola da gamba with Ensemble Galilee. A little over six years ago, I started going to Walter Reed to play for wounded warriors and their families. And on the very first day that I went, I went to Malone House, which is like, it's like a really nice hotel, only everyone there has visible or invisible injuries. And I sat in the corner playing the viola da gamba thinking, what was I thinking when this really nice young man rolled up in his wheelchair and started listening? And I played for him for a while, and then we started to chat. And then I gave him a quick viola da gamba lesson by uh, balancing the instrument up on my toes. And I put my scarf between the instrument and his wheelchair because his leg had been blown off. And, and I taught him how to bow and how to finger. And he played for a little while. And then I played for him some more. And I said to him, would you mind telling me what happened? And he told me about the day that he was in the back of the truck in Iraq and an improvised explosive projectile came through and blew his leg off. And the thing that I will never forget is that he did not lose consciousness. From the moment it happened until he got to the aid station 11 miles later, he was awake. And it was this, he's an extraordinary person. Um, it was amazing. And so then I played for him some more he turned to go to lunch and he turned back and he looked at me with the biggest smile on his face and he said, ma'am, this was a once in a lifetime experience. So I, I got home, I called my friends Sue and Ginger, I'm like, we are doing this every Friday. And they're like, okay, we're in. So I'm going to tell you about some of the things that you'll hear if you volunteer to work with wounded warriors. And you'll hear a soldier who was first deployed in the first Gulf War and then Bosnia and then Korea and when she was sent back to the desert for the second time, she suffered from severe post-traumatic stress and was medevaced from Baghdad to Walter Reed. And when we first saw her, she would just walk by. It was like she didn't e we didn't register that we were there. We're three people playing music, didn't register. After some months, she would sit down. And many, many, many months later, she said to us that she had been a dancer before she was a soldier. And that as a dancer, she always had music in her head. She listened to music all the time. It was a complete part of her life. And that after her injury, she couldn't hear music anymore, literally. She didn't hear us as we passed by. She could not bring it to mind. And what she said was that we gave music back to her and that music gave her her life back. And you'll hear a child say, we, we play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star when the kids come through. And I was alone one day, and I finished playing Twinkle Twinkle, and I said to the little girl, are you here to see your daddy? And she looked up at me, and she said, my daddy got dead, and my granda granddaddy is here to take me home today. And you'll hear a man say, he's my brother. He was in a three-truck convoy in Afghanistan that was hit, they hit an IED so big that everyone was killed except my brother, and he was without oxygen for seven minutes and the doc said he would never walk, he would never talk, he would never feed himself. And he took his first step last week. And so I said to this badly injured man in the wheelchair, would you like to hear happy or sad music? And he said to me quietly and c 
clearly sad. So for the next 35 minutes, we played the most beautiful, sad music that we could think of as he sat tilted back in his wheelchair with his eyes closed. So I'm asking you to join me in changing the world and to send your artists into the community. And if they say that they don't play background music, this is what background music can do. Because the day after Major Nadal Hassan opened fire at Fort Hood and shot 38 people was a terrible day at Walter Reed. And it was a terrible day because Nadal Hassan had been a psychiatrist at Walter Reed. And my friend, the sniper, who had spent his entire adult life as a special forces sniper, who when he was blown up in Baghdad lost the vision and hearing on his right side and the use of his three fingers on his left hand, and he'd been a right-eyed, left-handed shooter, the day after Major Nadal Hassan opened fire was a terrible day because my friend knew that anywhere he was in the world, he could be in the sights of someone else's sniper rifle. He and his three friends played the viola da gamba, and their talk was crazy. It was disturbing. It was paranoid. But there was a safe place for them in the world that day, and it was sitting with music. So please, want to do oncology and they don't want to do pediatrics and they don't want to do wounded warriors, just place them in the lobby of your community hospital and I promise you that they will change the world and the world will change them. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, you're in the five minutes to shine session and I seem to be shining in front of that light right now myself. Um, and I want to welcome you and also encourage you to use our voting sheets, which our volunteers and um, colleagues are, are handing out as you walk on to the next level um, later today to present um, his or her presentation at the awards lunch in front of our membership and board. So we look forward to seeing uh, who your favorites are and tallying them at the end of our presentation. So now it's time for illusionist Vitali Beckman. Hello, everyone. Uh, you can start the slides, please. You know, since I was a kid, I wanted to turn my mask because I was born in Soviet Union. A play, that's me. <laughs> and uh, who knew that today I would look like Seinfeld? <laughs> or that, that I would sound like Borat? <laughs> okay, you know, <laughs> when I grew older, my family moved to Israel, and later I moved to Vancouver. I've always felt that a wor the world could be a better, happier place if people could love what they do and do what they love. And not just like it, but be truly passionate about it. I discovered that when I was 15, I saw a David Copperfield show where he did a lot of uh, grand scale magic, like he made airplanes, trains disappear. He also did something small with just a couple of rubber bands. And I was trying to figure it out. Now at first I couldn't, but then I thought, how would I do it if I had to show it to someone? So I tried and it worked. My mom was impressed. No, actually, my, fr <laughs> my friends actually loved it too. And I started to come up with my own ideas. I um, realized I have the ability to create new illusions, to bring imagination to reality. And, uh, but my parents, you know, from Soviet Union, they were very practical. They said, I, we would like you to get a real job. So for four and a half years, I studied engineering in Technion, which is like MIT in the US. I don't know how I got my bachelor's degree because I skipped at least half of the lectures. And my favorite book from my first year in engineering was Stanislavski's An Actor Prepares. <laughs> Whenever I did not skip a lecture, I chose to study the lecturer's performing skills rather than to listen to what he was teaching. One time during my job and very brief career in engineering, my boss calls me and says, Vitali, I heard you do magic at work. I'm like, uh, yes, that's true. Could you show me some? <laughs> you know, finally I got the courage. I quit my job and I moved to North America. In the airport, you could see my weeping parents 
crying girlfriend, but I was smiling. <laughs> you know, living overseas was not easy, but my imagination illuminated the path because what I saw in my mind was so beautiful, I was determined to make it real and share it with the world. I saw things like making drawings and pictures come to life. I wanted to put audience members inside a painting. I also wanted to amaze people in the most personal way possible. I wanted to make their faces disappear from their driver's licenses. Yeah, some of my, uh, <laughs> some of my visions were <laughs> this gentleman's holding on to his driver's license. Some of my visions were not only impossible, they were also illegal. <laughs> but you know, coming up with ideas is easy. It's making them real that took me years. And um, it's because there are no guides how to make them real. I usually, I come up with ideas that have never been done before, that are impossible to begin with. So it's simply working by trial and error until whether it takes five months or five years. I don't care until it works. Because when I finally perform it for an audience, and to them, it feels like true wonder, then for me, all that effort is truly worth it. And you know, I think, you know, my parents today, they're my biggest fans. Um, a lot of my colleagues mentioned to me that I inspired them with my original creations. And I think you should be happy that I'm not an engineer as well. Because <laughs> I think you're, you should be happy I'm not building your bridges. <laughs> but instead, I choose to bridge reality and imagination. Now, every time I, uh, I give life to an idea, I feel more alive, as if that idea is now a part of me. And uh, if you have an idea, a dream, and if you have the passion and the drive to see it through, you can turn it into a picture, a plan. And then that plan can turn Thanks very much. I bet Seinfeld can't do that. <laughs> Just guessing. Um, next up is Lynn Newman, and um, she's going to tell us a story. All right, is this on? We're good to go? Let's roll, guys. In 2006, I adopted an eight-year-old golden retriever Labrador mix named Sonny. When you have a dog, you suddenly become aware of what's on the ground because their nose is always down there trying to put something in their mouth that should not be in their mouth. In looking down, I realized there's a lot of trash on the ground and most of it's plastic. Sonny and I used to go to Prospect Park in Brooklyn, which is eight blocks from my apartment, to play every morning. Because she's an older dog and several years, she couldn't walk that far, so we'd go to the corner, which is 50 yards from my front door. And counting trash. Some days there'd be six pieces, others 128. Now, multiply that by 13,000 miles of sidewalk in New York City. That is an insane amount of trash. What happens to it? Well, street litter ends up going down storms, which combines with your sink and toilet water on its way to a water treatment facility plant. During heavy rains, which are now the norm, the system overflows, spewing trash and sewage into local waterways. This then follows currents and ends up either back on land or in an ocean's gyre. Now, plastic doesn't biodegrade. It might break into smaller bits, but it doesn't ever go away. I was realizing this is a crisis, and I was developing an obsession. 
Now, I'm a choreographer, so how I internalize and make sense of things is through creation. So I decided to make a piece. I reached out to the Earth Institute for help with research and also began collecting plastic six-pack holders, which would serve as the basis for the costumes. I worked with three local pizzerias, and in three months, we had collected 5,000 of them. I also began thinking, how can I reach more people with this important message? And my answer was, take the work where people and trash are. So I wrote some grants to take our work outdoors. Several came through, and the dancers and I began traipsing to Manhattan Beach and Coney Island to rehearse. And in Dancing on Sand, we began to um, uh, unearth generous amounts of trash. Again, mostly plastic. I signed up as a coastal cleanup volunteer, and along with performances, organized people to come and pick up litter off of the beach. The turnout for these events was amazing, more than we'd ever seen in a theater. Okay, we were a little trashy, but it was important work. The following year, we repeated the projects, and thanks to a feature in the New York Times, our numbers that showed up were exponentially greater. Now, by 2001, I was connected with national and international organizations addressing water and plastic pollution. I even organized a trash tour of New York City for the BMW Good Time Lab created a character called polyethylene that was performing at cabarets and symposiums around the city. And then my phone started ringing. Can Artichoke Dance Company come and perform for National Water Dances Day? Or for a benefit for the Plastic Pollution Coalition? My volunteering my time was one thing, but committing my company meant resources, and I needed to make a decision about what direction we were going to take. I kept thinking about people who would stop and watch us take a picture or video, engage us in questions about our work, lend their hands to cleaning the beach, or even join us in dancing. I realized this is where my passion is and I had to dive all in. So today, Artichoke Dance performs a lot in highly public trafficked locations. We've altered our mission and we're working with environmental agencies internationally and nationally who support our work. Rather than clamoring to get butts in seats, we're performing for thousands who probably would never ever know who we are or what we do. We've engaged people in environmental activism and introduced them to dance. We've learned how to navigate, navigate crowds and draw them along. Our current challenge is to figure out who exactly that person taking a picture is and what the benefits we have are for them. But one thing is certain, my work has changed. And I have too. And it's all because I started looking down. Sunny passed away during Hurricane Sandy. A couple days later, I took her favorite toy to Prospect Park, but it was barricaded. So I a approached a park's employee, explaining my dog had passed away. I just needed to take this tennis ball and throw it around where we used to play. He explained that there were falling limbs, and it was just too unsafe for me to go into the park. And then he looked at my face and said, wait a minute. You're that woman who does performances about trash. I saw you guys dancing at Coney Island when I was there checking out things at the park one day and saw a bunch of volunteers picking up the beach. He said, go ahead, but just be careful. Now, he didn't know Sunny or how she had initiated that work, but he did know me and what I did and the value it had. And that never would have happened without Sunny or the passion she inspired in me for reaching out and picking up. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. That, that story always chokes me up when I see that dog. What is it about an animal, right? So Lynn gave a nifty bottle, uh, which is not a bottle. Um, it's not plastic. And I'm sure she would like to encourage you to use similar products when you're drinking your water, or in my case, after this show, vodka, out of this. Um, so I hope you're all voting. I hope you're um, paying attention to who your favorite person is um, and the favorite story that you're hearing and that you'll let us know before you leave who that is so that person can progress to the next stage um, of, of our process uh, with Five Minutes to Shine. Our next speaker is John Slade. You ready, John?
Taco. You ever doubt your next step or the next word out of your mouth? I used to do that all the time. In school, I used to think of the cool comeback when I was walking home, not when it didn't do any good. So, but I was saved when I was 12 years old from terminal shyness by a drama teacher who looked like Abraham Lincoln, only it was a woman. <laughs> and her name was Patty Lumen, and Patty Lumen said, this is drama and speech, so this will be about finding your voice. So try on as many voices as you want until you find some that you like. And that was brilliant because she knew that most of us were coming there for that, not to become actors, but to find our authentic voice that maybe would speak up for us in real life. And I had an actual conversion experience right there, sitting on the floor, listening to her talk, which I wasn't getting in church or Boy Scouts or anywhere else, when Miss Lumen unpacked our town for us and revealed that the stage manager might be God. And I said, these people are talking about some of the same stuff I'm thinking about. If that's what they talk about in drama class, sign me up. So in senior year, though, I uh, went to another school. The teachers were way more uptight there. But I got to play Henry Drummond in Inherit the Wind. And Drummond gets to say some incredible things about evolution and religion. And on opening night, well, we had a triumph. But the second night, the largest and most conservative church in our town closed down our production. Reportedly, I brought this on myself because I said hell and damn, and they explicitly told me not to, but I knew there was a bigger reason. So that evening, I went to the evening service of that church. I'm still wearing my big red galooses from the play. And I said, I'm here to see Reverend Brimley. And they said, all right, and they led me back. And I faced Reverend Brimley, and I had nothing to say. All I could think of were the words from the play, and that didn't quite seem to fit. So <clears throat> where was my voice? And the answer is that it hadn't evolved yet. It was trying to, but it would take a little bit of time. Eventually, I would become an actor, or I would marry an actor. We'd give birth to two little actors, and then... Uh, when I was 50 years old, I went off and became a drama teacher, and I would tell my kids, this class will be about finding your voice. And that by that time, I had found a voice that I resonated with in Walt Whitman, the bearded bard of Breaking Bad. I just loved uh, his music of his poetry, and I found a way to get it across to high school kids. And Whitman is a very, very hard sell. One girl said, ew, I don't like him. He celebrates himself. That's so conceited, I'm not even kidding. I said, well, what he's celebrating is he's just like you. You know, he's made of the same stardust, and he's pointing his way back to the garden. She said, you mean he was a hippie? I said, no, he was a rapper. I am the poet of the body. She said, did he sound like that? I said, Yes, he did, <laughs> to them. And so in that instant, I had found a way to teach Walt Whitman. And you should just hear 30 kids rapping, I hear America singing. It's just glorious. But in 2012, they handed me my pink slip, declining enrollment. But after I retired, Whitman would not leave me alone. In my head, I kept hearing the song of the open road, let's go. We must not stop here. So here I am, two years later, with all of you. I'm bringing my Whitman play with me and carrying my old delicious burdens. I carry them with me wherever I go. But see, Walt Whitman is such an optimist that I am looking at the world now through Whitman's eyes. And did you know that Whitman is a self-proclaimed evolutionist and when you take the long evolutionary view, trends seem a lot more hopeful. So yes, I am trusting that Whitman's bigger transcendental vision. And my wife, Lori, and I now have followed Walt out onto the open road, and it is leading somewhere. My passions have all flowed together, 
And uh, if Reverend Brimley were here right now, I would find my voice. I would say, sir, your creation story is true but partial. Creation is a continuing miracle, and I am living proof of it. I lost my job. It caused an evolutionary crisis. But as a result of this, I am happier than I ever have been in my life. I'm 66 years old, and I am a work in progress. And aren't we all? Thank you, John, very much. Isn't it extraordinary what you can do in five minutes um, and what you can learn from a story in just five minutes? Um, it, it's really been such a privilege for me to walk through these stories over a period of a couple months um, and then to hear them with you today. Um, Jay Ruby is our next and final performer, um, presenter. And um, just a reminder to please vote. You should have your ballots with you and we will collect them as you leave the room um, when we're done today. And Jay, take us out. Yes, I am ready. Red ropes between us, crawling between necessity and compromise in cross-cultural collaboration. I grit my teeth, bite my tongue, and think, I hate this red rope. It's useless, it hinders the expression of our vocabulary, it's a borderline cliche, and as a director, I want to get rid of it. Five performers, faces full of sweat and dirt and exhausted from acrobatic stilt walking, stare at me in frustration. Four weeks down, one to go, my company, the Carpetbag Brigade, is rehearsing and developing a performance with Nem Catacoa Teatro from Bogota in the small mountain town of Carmen de Viberal, Colombia. It's the middle of a long day, the sun is heating up. Young children pour into the courtyard as the after-school program begins. It's getting noisier. Next week, we present our work for the first time, and the following week, we present at the Ibero-Americano Festival. The cast is nervous, especially our colleagues from Bogota. Me too. And a performer asks, can we just get rid of this red rope? Two weeks earlier, I introduced El Guzano, the caterpillar, a series of synchronized movements requiring performers to crawl rhythmically on the ground on and around each other with their stilts on. It was sweaty, dirty, and difficult work, especially on concrete and asphalt. Initially, the performers resisted. The movements are awkward. It's hard to do. It hurts. It will take a week to get three good minutes. Nico Cifuentes, the director of Nem Catacoa Teatro, tells his crew, we are not here to do what we know, but to try what we don't know. Nico is my colleague and co-director of the Dios de la Adrenalina project. He introduced the red rope, insisting on its inclusion because of its metaphorical meaning to the topic we are exploring, the impact of contraband cocaine on each of our societies. No one in his company is more than two degrees of separation from an experience of violence through narco-trafficking. Some are closer. To negate the rope is to negate their desire to express that experience. It must be included. So I smile, probably a grimace, and respond, no, we need to use the rope. Our theater companies specialize in acrobatic stilt walking. Exchanging the craft of our technique, we develop a model of collaboration with two directors, two companies, a bilingual spoken word artist, and three Andean musicians. It's complicated and there's a lot of moving parts. It's not about aesthetics and results. It's about broadening and understanding diverse narratives and making time for our necessities to be discovered and space for them to coexist and evolve. With time and space, the caterpillar gestates into an elaborate floor dance with acrobatic stilts, illuminating the path of a plant often misused for power. With time and space, the red rope unravels, connecting us to the suffering we each inherit, living in a labyrinth of misunderstanding. Through sustained contact, we disengage the traps of habitual narratives. We understand the necessities of the other. 
it supersedes any narrative we try to tell. It becomes the narrative we live. Bridging a cultural divide transforms our circumstances. It reconfigures our personal limits, allowing spectators to witness two cultures in the act of reconciliation. The felt experience of how trust functions shifts. Perception changes. Habitual social narratives are uprooted, making space for new ones to arise. Crawling on asphalt with stilts and clinging to red ropes was the gauntlet we had to run to affirm our trust in recognizing each other's narratives. But the essential act in our creative process is transferable. It is the will to listen and affirm diverse narratives. If creative work is to approach the cultural divides engulfing our country and our world, it will serve us well to sustain engagement in which cultural reconciliation overrides aesthetic achievement in terms of value. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, so if you haven't voted, please do that before you leave the room. I'd also like to encourage you that if you know that could be part of our annual five minutes to shine next year, all for um, applications and join us in this in the same um, pro process next year. We'd love to have more voices and, and more of you on stage. Um, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we hope that you come to the conference and um, that you'll vote before you leave. And could you just join me in um, thanking our presenters again today? <laughs>